Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is Videocast 60 and Podcast Episode 50 for the uh, week ending December 11th, 2020. Uh, coming to you from sunny Florida this week. Uh, we uh, took uh, some time down here uh, working remotely, and it's just beautiful. I'm normally an East Coast guy. Uh, Palm Beach, Palm Beach area. Uh, we w came to Captiva, uh, uh, which is uh, near Sanibel Island, uh, Fort Myers Airport, and uh, it's just beautiful down here. This morning, I took the eight-year-old out to uh, on the jet skis before the open, and what's amazing is in the Gulf, you can hit 50 miles an hour on the jet ski, and she's got her dad's jeans. She likes speed, uh, and there's just no wake. You can just, you know, go straight out and we went through all the islands etc so a uh, good time so welcome this week and we're gonna kick it off with our media spots as we always do and key points that we covered because it covers a lot of information in a short period of time you can review those at hedgefundtips.com just click on the featured on button at the top here and you can uh, bring up all of those it's a it's really a good way to get all of the week's key points in a very short period of time. So uh, yesterday I had the pr uh, privilege of being on the Clayman Countdown with Liz Clayman on Fox Business. I'd like to thank Liz and Jacqueline D'Ambrosi Scales for having me on. And the subject matter was the uh, IPO market this week. Certainly hot, hot, hot. And we were talking particularly about Airbnb Everyone knows the story. It just shot up uh, from the IPO price. It's, uh, they valued it uh, at $68. They raised $3.5 billion. And what I said to Liz was, there's basically a situation you have an abundance of demand and a scarcity of supply. And that's largely by design. You saw it both in the Airbnb IPO and in the DoorDash IPO. Um, where they just absolutely rocketed. And in the case of Airbnb, I, I think they have certainly a high quality business, a tremendous moat. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it's basically now trading up to 25 times sales, 120 times earnings. Uh, can it grow into that? I, I think Airbnb has a durable enough moat uh there there you know 4 million hosts in 220 countries etc and liz asked well would you buy it here and i said uh, probably the way to look at this one is kind of like snowflake where it had a huge ramp out of the ipo gate and then it settled down 3 to 4 weeks later and that's probably when you'd want to take a look at it um as far as doordash uh, DoorDash valuation uh, was is uh, got up to sixty five billion dollars. Its private market valuation before that was sixteen billion. So to see that type of rip, obviously they've had huge benefit from COVID. Revenues were up uh, two hundred twenty six percent the first nine months of the year. But they have competition with uh, Uber, with Grubhub, etc. And this valuation is twenty two times sales. I read a note that they would have to compound their revenues at 40% per year for the next 10 years to grow into their valuation, DoorDash would. And I think, you know, they, they claim to have a moat in the suburb areas. That's kind of their edge over Uber Eats and Grubhub. I think that moat can be eroded pretty quickly, but they, you know, they have a little bit of first mover status. They focused on that niche. I don't like this one as much as Airbnb, and at, at these levels, as I told Liz, you know, I like to buy things on sales. I'm sticking with banks, defense stocks, and energy, and I also threw in there a stat we're going to cover today that uh, the most hated stock in the S&P 500 relative to the most loved, Wells Fargo relative to Apple, Wells Fargo has now outperformed Apple uh, in the last three months, since September 1st, uh, by th over 30%. Wells Fargo has done 30% relative outperformance. I think it's 33% relative outperformance over Apple. 
I'm betting on the cyclical rotation. I'll leave these high flyers to other people. But if Airbnb did come in materially in coming weeks or months, I would potentially take a look. DoorDash, uh, not my cup of tea. And this the story here that you want to keep in mind with these IPOs, this is by design. So what the bankers are doing here is number one, when the music's playing, you gotta dance. Uh, as I said, abundance of demand, scarcity of supply. That supply is created on, on purpose. They each only floated 10% of the company, and uh, so there you have it. Do, um, uh, tremendous demand, 25 times sales on Airbnb, 22 times sales on DoorDash, and um, these should moderate in coming weeks or months, at, at which time uh, might be worth taking a look but I'll stick to my knitting. Moving on, uh, again, thank you to Jacqueline D'Ambrosia, uh, D'Ambrosi, Scales, and Liz. Um, last week, we did our podcast video cast a day early on Thursday, so I didn't get to thank Sean Langlois for featuring our note last week and interview on Market Watch. Uh, it's, it said, uh, there's easy money to still be made this year, and that's been our consistent message for the last few months. That, uh, and he quoted this I believe banks, defense stocks, and pockets of energy will be as good, if not orders of magnitude, better in coming quarters than buying the general indices were in late March. And he also embedded the interview I did on Yahoo last week, where I talked about this with Shauna Smith and Adam Shapiro over at Yahoo. So uh, big thanks goes out to Sean Langlois for uh, putting this in Market Watch. Moving on, uh, that was published on late Thursday and Sunday. I didn't see it till Friday, actually. Uh, also on late Friday, I was on One American News Network with Greta Wall, and uh, the, the previous time I had been on her show, was August 31st, I believe it was, either you can look under Featured On, um, yeah, it was August 31st, and I st stated that cyclicals outperformed the first six months after an election, and that they performed the first eight quarters in a new business cycle, but I laid out the most hated versus the most loved stock, and that day, ironically, was the peak. It was when Apple was splitting. I was on talking about the Apple split, and I talked about Apple, Apple's relative valuation. At that time, I think it was trading at 39 times earnings relative to the S&P, 20 times, and versus uh, Wells Fargo trading at a discount to book and how they had historically responded moving forward. And since that interview, uh, Wells Fargo, it's just completely flipped the switch. Uh, Wells Fargo's outperformed Apple by 33%. So that was nice to recap and kind of circle back with her on that. Um, you know, we covered some of the short-term euphoria. We covered uh, the top five weights in the S&P starting to moderate down from 24, 25% weighting down to 21, 22% weighting. So the change is happening. We talked about the lag in fiscal and monetary policy over $20 trillion in the system globally to cure a $3.6 trillion problem. It's a lagged effect. So while you're getting these shut shutdowns in the short term, uh, it'll be offset by that money starting to hit six to nine months out. If you recall, most of the stimulus was put into place in late spring and early summer. We're now going to start to hit the benefits. You couple that with the vaccine uh, um, and uh, we're off to the races. We also talked about the out output gap, which we worked on uh, last week's podcast. And you can review that uh, was, a, was a critical point. But the, the theme was that uh, no Grinch this year. Um, and, uh, and also that not only are we coming off 33.1% annualized GDP for Q3, Atlanta Fed still has the, uh, Q4 GDP, I believe at about 11.1%, which is much higher than expectations. We also discussed the jobs report and I laid out that the most important number in that was the unemployment rate was coming down to 6.7 from, you know, it's worst was 14.1%. And we added a bunch of jobs, retail 35,000, leisure and hospitality 31,000, construction 27, manufacturing 27, and healthcare. Hourly wages are going up. That's going to be a continued trend. Uh, the extra money they've had to pay people for COVID and COVID safety, that's not going to come back down. And that's going to be a key ingredient in moderate 
rapidly rising inflation in coming years. Um, so keep an eye on the hourly wages moving forward. The other thing that we didn't get to talk about was the uh, regional shutdowns uh, were really most pronounced in those areas. We covered in a couple weeks ago in one of our articles that the cities shutting down and having restrictions are ironically all of the cities that have the highest taxpayer burden um, in each region. W w what that effectively means is if the city were to pay off all their debts, how much would each taxpayer have to contribute hypothetically to get back in the black? And the worst are New York City, which just shut down uh, indoor dining today. Chicago's had shutdowns in for a couple weeks, Philadelphia, Oakland, Portland, San Francisco. And it's one for one. The places that are shutting down are continuing to have the worst taxpayer burden. And, you know, there, there's kind of a play here to try to force this uh, additional piece of the stimulus bill uh, to get the state funding, which is which is really just going to be a tricky back and forth. Um, and I said in a Reuters quote uh, this week that I think we'll get 900, you know, we'll get a stimulus package done, but it's not going to be anywhere near 900 billion. And I think that's proven prescient. And they're now at kind of a gridlock because uh, the Speaker of the House wants material amounts of money to go back to the state and local. And the um, uh, leader, uh, leader McConnell in the Senate uh, does not want the local money. He wants the money contained to small businesses and unemployed individuals that are directly affected by COVID, not pre-existing shortfalls. So they're kind of at gridlock. They passed a short-term spending bill uh, or sent to the to the white to um, to the White House for signature today, which is why the market kind of rebounded into the close. Um, so we'll see how that plays. But I think 900 billion is off the table. It would be nice to see if we could get you know that 500. I believe it's 569 billion that was that Secretary Mnuchin took back from the Fed unused CARES money. Get that reallocated quickly before the end of the month when uh, many people will have trouble paying their rent and run out of unemployment and the uh, mortgage uh, uh, moratorium, etc. So uh, those are some key factors that we want to want to see put in place. So thank you to Greta Wall for having me on One American News last Friday. And then uh, late Friday uh, after the close, I was on CGTN Global Business with Sean Caleb's uh, thanks to Sean and to Dalal Pektas for having me on and in that segment we covered the uh, China economic data and kind of relative to the US there was an article out saying that you know China is growing faster and um, I just clarified it with the facts in that the epicenter their epicenter cases peaked two months before ours February our first peak was in April, and it looks like for, for Q3, China had 4.9% uh, GDP growth. We had 33.1% annualized, uh, and Q4, their estimates are 5.8%, and our Atlanta Fed estimates are over 11%. For 2020, They China will be the only developed uh, nation with a positive GDP at 2.1%. Uh, versus the U.S. at negative three, uh, over negative three percent, probably negative three and a half. Uh, but 2021, uh, they're expected to grow seven to eight percent. We could grow as much as five to six percent. I'm on the high end of that. Now we're seeing uh, analysts take their numbers up. They were at three eight. Now I'm seeing four to six. I think it's going to be higher because M2 money supply growth was almost 25 percent year on year. And usually about a quarter of that translates into the real economy. Obviously, a vaccine is now a catalyst, but with that amount of money and liquidity uh, just now hitting with that six to nine month lag, uh, I, I do think we're going to have uh, very, very high GDP growth, which is why we've been so aggressive on cyclicals, banks, defense stocks and energy, uh, which I emphasized with Liz uh, yesterday. So the key contrast, though, between Beijing and the U.S. is that they are exiting their ultra accommodative policy while we still have the foot on the gas. So that could enable the U.S. to continue to grow relatively quickly. Um, if they don't reverse that trend of pulling back stimulus potentially a little bit too early. 
and I suggested that it would be wise to keep the foot on the gas for the next six to 12 months. And then when you have the full global synchronized recovery, then pull it back by doing it too soon. It doesn't help the world and it certainly doesn't help them. So um, uh, hopefully that, that stimulus can, can remain accommodative on their side. It will certainly remain accommodative on our side. Uh, they also asked about the reciprocity of regarding uh, pulling Chinese listings. This is this sounds much worse than it is. It's uh, not really going into effect for three years, and then it will be the exchanges, not the government, enforcing it. Uh, the idea is that unless the Chinese listed companies, about 190, can meet the standard auditing standards that the U.S. companies have to meet to tap our U.S. capital markets, then they will be delisted. Now, 30 out of those 190 have. Uh, secondary listings in Hong Kong, I would imagine over that three year period more will do so as well as uh, negotiation, the negotiation tenor will probably be slightly different with uh, different administrations in coming years. So by the time it goes into effect, it, it may look a lot different. It's more of a headline than anything with teeth at this moment. Um, you know, but uh, the, the data continues to be good and we continue to focus on the China data because it's been a leading indicator for what our data starts to look like. Uh, the raw material prices and output is up, fastest factory activity in 10 years, improved domestic demand, and um, uh, and their manufacturing reading, their manufacturing PMI rather, was the highest in, 10, in three years and their orders were, the uh, factory orders were uh, highest in 10 years. So I think that speaks to global demand normalizing. Um, they've had a tremendous amount of demand from uh, PPE and work from home and study from home equipment electronics, but that um, is also now being buttressed by their getting tremendous domestic demand as well, which is a positive thing. So uh, it's all going to continue to accelerate the, um, the stimulus is in the system and they move forward. So again, thanks to Sean and Dalal for that. And finally, uh, the article earlier in this week about the stimulus package when it looked like there was going to be a $900 billion package slam dunk were all the headlines. My um, quote was, I think the bill is going to pass, but it'll be smaller than $980 billion. And I want to thank Shriya Ramakrishnan and Shriyashi Sanyal for including me in their article in Reuters. Now, a few key things before we get to the article of the week. There's an article in um, Business Insider. JP Morgan sees $1 trillion flowing into the stock market in 2021 and one of the best environments in years. Uh, this is from their head quantitative an analyst, uh, up to $1 trillion could flow into stocks next year, um, told CNBC, we're, uh, of inflow coming from systematic flows, hedge fund positioning, further retail buying, buybacks, which we're going to cover this week, and very importantly, a continued rotation from non-equity into equity, said Lacos Bujas is, is the uh, key quant at JP Morgan. And that was an interesting um, uh, point because he also noted in his article, which we've been talking about weekly for many weeks, is that money supply is growing about 24% year over year. This is the largest increase since the 1940s. Now, this is an important parallel because in the article of the week, we talked about the late 40s when debt to GDP hit these levels, 120% debt to GDP. Everyone said it's we're going to become a banana republic. And within six six years, by 1953, it was down. It was basically cut in half. It was in the low 60s. And why, why did that happen? Because all of that money hit the system on a lagged effect and um, you had massive GDP growth and we're going to hit the exact same thing in coming years as a result of all of this globally coordinated fiscal and monetary policy coupled with the catalyst of the vaccine and getting back to normal global pent-up demand etc so um, so I agree with this and this was a great article now I want to shift gears into some some uh, sector anal analysis, my favorite three. If you've listened to me for more than a week or two, you know the last three months I've been hammering banks, defense stocks, and energy. 
So uh, this was a Goldman note. Goldman sees uh, higher oil prices in 2021 after the OPEC plus agreement. We covered that. So they basically were supposed to cut. They were supposed to reduce their cuts from 7.7 million barrels a day down to 5.7 million barrels a day. Instead, they um, only reduced it to 7.2 million barrels a day. So they're cutting about 7% of global demand on a daily basis into um, re global recovery. And so these levels are going to continue to go up. Now, why is that important? Well, and we saw Brent hit $50 this week. So that was that was really uh, great. We've been saying you're going to, you know, three two three months two months ago or so i pulled up a chart of the energy sector and uh said you know we're going to see 60 dollars oil within the next 12 months and at that point it was like no one there was so much bearish sentiment and um and and so here we are it's starting to turn and it's just the beginning now this chart is very interesting this is the tech sector as uh defined by the xlk etf just an easy way to do it ratio chart relative to the XLE this is the energy and this is an amazing reversal when you just visualize it obviously we all see anecdotally what's happening to energy stocks versus tech stocks but this ratio uh was the same and I've I've talked a lot in the last few months about um a commodity cycle an emerging market cycle emanate uh starting that would potentially be similar to the early 2000s and I've referenced that over and over and over and you look you look at these ratio charts the the underperformance of energy relative to tech up until early this year due to covid was even more extreme than it was in 2000 and from two, you know basically 2002 to 2008 was the greatest rally in energy and energy stocks in history and commodities general and emerging markets and it got even more extreme and you can see this is a reversal you don't need a, um, a magnifying glass to see what's happening here this is a dramatic reversal of trend dramatic outperformance uh, of energy relative to tech in the last two months that's going to persist it's it's absolutely collapsing which is good for energy and less good on a relative basis for tech um, and then i i also pulled up some monthly charts of large cap energy stocks just to show a few so you could put into context like you know you see these 40 30 40 50 percent rallies in individual stocks in the last couple of months and you're like i missed it okay did you miss it well <laughs> look at uh energy transfer i mean it, it's just getting started look at uh this is china s p i mean that there are other factors at play here these are two chinese two of the largest chinese producers which i think might actually prove to be interesting um this is enterprise product partners these are just getting started to get back to normalized levels not to mention we could overshoot once the demand comes back with the cuts coupled remember these cuts go to april 2022 even if they drop down to five seven uh it could be a very very big deal um you have um uh kinder morgan i mean these are just beginning again this reminds me of a while ago a few weeks back i said do these stocks look like a bubble because everyone was calling the stock market a bubble before the election and all of a sudden all these stocks that weren't in bubbles were up 30 40 50 percent in the month of november after we put that out but these guys are still just getting started when you stand back and that's going to be the theme of this this week's video cast podcast is standing back and taking a little longer term perspective you see what an amazing opportunity we have here Concho Resources, Suncor, these are just beginning. These are, you know, these go back to 2016. They're not even getting started. If you go back further, you'll see that they were double these high levels, and, and we could certainly see situations like that. Um, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Total. Uh, what else do we have here? Hess, ConocoPhillips. Again, just getting started. You know, you look at them on a daily chart, you're like, oh my God, it's up, you know, almost 50% in two months. Well, guess what? It's got more to go. Valero, uh, Royal Dutch Shell. You, does this look like a bubble? This is just starting. BP, Occidental, look at this, down from 90. Now, that's uh, Oxy's a bit diluted, and some of the smaller players are going to go bankrupt, which is why I'm showing you the large caps. But Pioneer, 
Does that look like a bubble? Royal Dutch Shell, EOG. I mean, come on, Schlumberger down, you know. So these are tremendous opportunities uh, that on a, I think on a certainly cyclical in the short term, but secular over the next five, five years, uh, doubles, triples, quadruples, etc. So I just wanted to get that visualization. Now, uh, remember, that what's the theme we covered with Liz or have covered also with Liz for the last few months, as well as on the podcast video cast, banks, defense stocks and energy. So now let's talk about uh, banks. So this is the tech ETF relative to the financials ETF. And this is the exact same thing in 2000. You hit this peak ratio chart where tech was dramatically outperforming financials and then it just collapsed and financials took off and value and cyclicals at the beginning of a new business cycle and tech took a breather. Now, does it mean these tech companies all went out of business? No, Amazon continued to improve its fundamentals. Um, you know, Oracle's still here. Microsoft took time to regroup. Uh, Cisco, you know, all these big Qualcomm, NVIDIA, you know, NVIDIA was down whatever it was, 90 some odd percent. Now it's just been a monster. So uh, I think these companies like Airbnb and some of the SaaS companies and some of the major companies, I'm not saying we're going to get a tech wreck anything close to 2000 because the uh, the ingredients are different. Most of them are earning money. Most of them are high quality franchises. But the antitrust overhang, which we've discussed, that's going to hurt the big ones. Uh, that, that doesn't go away overnight, uh, just as it took Microsoft years. And it just changes the culture from offense and innovation to defense and preservation. And that, that culture, uh, it, it, it's, um, it, it's not the, be the best thing. So what an opportunity if you're able to get, a, you know, a Snowflake or a Airbnb two, three years from now at a very reasonable valuation where it could be 10 years from now if you buy it right. Uh, so, so that'll be a great opportunity. But the point here is you want to be buying the hell out of financials when this trend is reversing and it's reversing the last three and a half months here and it's just getting started. How do we know? Let's take a look again at the visuals. So here are some large cap, uh, banks, big diversified banks, JP Morgan, um, uh, Mitsubishi Financial, that's Jap Japanese bank, um, Westpac. Uh, UBS, Wells Fargo, does it, you know, this thing is up almost, you know, from 20 to 29, you know, almost 50%, 40 some odd percent in a month and a half. Does that look like it's a bubble? No, it's just getting started. This is going to trade back to book, which is around $40. And then like it did before uh, COVID, it's going to trade at a premium to book. And then at some point, it's going to trade up to 1.75 times book like it did just about two years ago. And uh, and you're looking at a 60 plus dollar stock. And I think book is going to dramatically increase as the uh, millennials continue housing formation, 85 million. I think this is a huge long term secular grower. And this is probably an $80 stock in the next three, four or five years. And I think it could be a 40, 50, $60 stock much, much, much quicker than that. Much quicker than that. Um, Citibank, uh, Bank of America. Um, you know, again, these are not bubbles. These are just getting started. And you can see where the money is flowing. It's flowing out of tech and into financials. And that doesn't mean that it's all flowing. It's not zero sum binary. It just means relative performance ratio chart. That's what this is. So now we've done banks and energy let's take a look at a visual on defense stocks my third favorite uh we don't have the data going all the way back because these etfs weren't uh alone but again you had huge runs here uh as defense stocks um and value stocks and cyclicals outperformed in the early 2000s before the crisis and the same thing that is a huge reversal in the last couple of months uh, money into defense stocks and out of tech. Let's take a look at the visualization for some of the bigger defense and aerospace stocks, Lockheed Martin, um, uh, Huntington Ingalls, uh, Northrop Grumman. These are not, you know, uh, general dynamics, just getting started. Um, Raytheon, just getting started. Boeing just recovering. The 737 is now off. That's going to play a huge role. Uh, Spirit Aero Systems. So there, there's just huge opportunity in these three seconds. So every, every sector. So everyone's focused on, 
you know, the Airbnb is doing too frothy. And yeah, you know, look, <laughs> the beauty of the capitalist system is people have the right to get their ass handed to them. And <laughs> that happens sometimes, you know, I mean, it, you buy something wrong or you buy it up and some people will buy it up and they'll double their money in the next two weeks and, and they'll score. And if they ring the register, it'll be a huge trade. That's not my knitting. But some will, you know, buy it just because it's a brand that they recognize and they don't understand anything about valuation. And it'll be, you know, the NVIDIA of uh, 2000, um, which is not a bad thing because NVIDIA continued to improve its business. And now it's one of the highest flying stocks. Uh, and that will happen for these high quality franchises. But I think, you know, over the next couple of years, um, you're going to find out in some of these overheated pockets of the market when the tide goes out who's swimming naked so um but i i think the opposite will be the case in the groups that i just showed you that we've been emphasizing for the last three months and that we're actively invested in and the other thing you're going to see look look at this raytheon's board okay's five billion dollar share buyback that game is just getting started another cheap stock that's not in the um three sectors that we've been really concentrated on the last few months, banks, defense stocks, and energy, uh, is Walgreens Boots Alliance. I like this play for two reasons. Number one, um, it's historically cheap. Number two, there was a tremendous amount of weight on this stock due to the UK Brexit issues. The UK COVID slowdown was much worse. Remember, they have huge exposure to the UK through Boots Alliance. But you're seeing some of the economic data there improve. We're going to get resolution one way or another with Brexit in the coming weeks. And in the US, they are well, well situated for a huge amount of business from the uh, administration of COVID vaccines. They're starting by going out to nursing homes and long-term cares like CVS. Uh, but they're also uh, going to be having, you know, millions of people through their stores and they're going to get a tremendous amount of front end business from administering uh, the shots in the U.S. and potentially in the U.K. as well. I'm not sure the setup there. Uh, this week, the stock was up a little bit early week. There's rumors. There have been rumors historically that they were going to try to do an LBO at $55 a share. I think the board should be taken out back and shot in the head if they uh, if they ever approved a, a, a situation at $55 a share, that is highway robbery. Uh, I think anything below 75, 80 bucks is theft. So let's hope that's not true, but uh, it was spiking on that news as well as the vaccine news. And uh, that was reported. The LBO rumors were reported by Credit Suisse and uh, Deutsche Bank. I think it's just nonsense. It was probably someone getting out of a position, but you know, at fifty five dollars it's it's nonsense i would I would be livid as a shareholder uh at seventy five or eighty dollars it's kind of interesting and I think it's a smart play if they did l b o it because they're gonna get all the upside free upside of the vaccine they're gonna get all the free upside of the recovery of the u k post covid uh and it's just a, a huge thing and they're gonna get this kind of culture change that it's not just a place people go to buy candy and you know uh, get their pharmacies filled, but I think they're going to shift into like a primary care type of environment where, you know, if you want to go see a doctor at 6 p.m. on a Friday, you can walk into the place and there'll be some kid out of medical school that they, whatever, that can give you a script for z pack or something like that if you have a cold. Uh, that's going to be huge. The key is getting the foot traffic and doing the front of store sales. I like that name uh, in addition to those other three groups. So on to the article of the week. Uh, I'm a Jersey kid. That's where I was raised. Obviously, we live in Connecticut now and um, uh, New York, et cetera. But, um, you know, Frankie Valley can't take my eyes off the stock market. And the reason is, you know, obviously you're just too too good to be true. I'm acknowledging, you know, there's a little bit of short-term froth and euphoria in some of the metrics we look at. Uh, so too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off you. You got to watch everything, you know, when, when you're skating on, on that type of ice where, you know, there is froth, but yet you could still have a melt up. You got to keep, keep, keep on it in the short term. Um, uh, but in the intermediate to long term, I want to hold you so much. I want to hold these stocks. We're at the beginning of a new business cycle. I per particularly want to hold banks, defense stocks, 
energy stocks because they're cheap and we went through what they look like. But I definitely click on play. Listen to Frankie Valley. You're going to enjoy that. It's going to put you in a good mood and that that's an important thing to do. Uh, so in the article, we covered the uh, appearance with Greta Wall. I also put this chart here so you could see that outperformance since September 1st, which um, you can see that Apple was down about 10%. Wells Fargo was up, down, uh, was up about 22%. So you had a relative outperformance, um, you know, over 30, well over 30%. And I think those trends are going to persist in the sectors that we've, we've been focused on. Um, the other thing that I pointed to was this plurality index. Uh, I put out indicators of the day on the site uh, each day, and one that came up this week was this plurality index. Uh, and what it pointed to was that while there is euphoria, while there is some you know short-term froth in the market, this um, it basically is the sum of the absolute values of the difference between the number of advancing and declining issues of the New York Stock Exchange, which is a better overall represent, representation than the S&P, which is tech weighted because of the because of FANG, etc. Um, but effectively, what you look at here is when this number is high, it's near a bottom. And when it's super low is when you should start to, you know, uh, pay attention for a top. Right now, this this number is still exceptionally high, despite the fact that we're just breaking out. So it it's indicating that there's a higher probability of breaking out than breaking down breaking down in a material way. Um, you know, if, if you were going to see a potential breakdown in a material way, we'd be look, looking down here at around twenty thousand or seventeen thousand five five hundred. We're still you know at twenty seven thousand and change. That's more indicative as you're coming down that you would see continued strength in uh, the NICE composite, which again is not FANG. It, it's it's um, all common stocks listed on the NICE, including ADRs, REITs, tracking stocks, and foreign companies. Much broader representation. That's where you know groups like banks, defense stocks, and energy will play a role in um, in pushing higher. Uh, even if some of the frothy pockets uh, are more subdued moving forward. The other thing that people pointed to, and, and what we're trying to do in this article is say, yeah, we acknowledge the short-term froth and euphoria, and yet all of the things that people are pointing to, if you, if you look back further than a month to two months, uh, were actually times in which the market did not correct meaningfully. Uh, in, in effect, the opposite may have been true or it corrected in time versus price. So it consolidated big gains, which we've had sideways for a few days or weeks and then took the next leg higher. Um, so the put call ratio we did the with the 10 day moving average, the CBOE put call. Everyone's looking at this number of uh, 0.71 and saying, wow, this is crazy. It is crazy relative to 1.3, which is where it was at the, um, at the uh, market crash on March 23rd. It's now down at these levels. And if you're only looking back a few months, you're like, it's, it hasn't, it's never been this low. No, it's actually exactly where it needs to be if you're talking about a secular bull market, which we've just... Um, uh, had a correction in and if you look through the mid 90s it was below the current levels for years for a decade it was and that was indicative not of complacency in a top it was indicative of a secular bull which uh, so how you would actually look at this if you were looking at the data objectively is that the market is not yet bullish enough from a secular bull market standpoint. When we start to trade in this 0.60 to 0.65 for some time, then we know we have a multi-year secular, we're in a multi-year sec secular bull type of environment. You know, through the 2000s, you know, we've had two cataclysmic events. I mean, the tech wreck of the early 2000s, you know, many, the NASDAQ was down 80-something 80, 80 percent, uh, many names down, you know, 90%, et cetera, many went out of business that didn't make any money. Uh, and then 2009, a once in a generation balance sheet, uh, crisis, which would have been a depression if they didn't take the actions that they took. So, um, 
so, so this has been recency bias, this elevated uh, protection that people have been paying for for two decades from recent battle scar recency bias. Now people are starting to put that in the rearview mirror, but they're not at a point where people get when they really start to panic into the market and you get these long secular runs. And I think this will be exacerbated in a positive way by the 85 million millennials just starting housing formation, which drove the boat post-World War II and it, with the boomers and is going to drive the boat moving forward. Um, okay, now, um, Goldman put out another thing that people are pointing to as negative. Goldman put out a note calling the current equity position extremely stretched. A guy named Macro Charts on Twitter, at Macro Charts, you can go check him out. He put out a couple good charts this week uh, that I posted here. And what he found was he actually measured that opinion that Goldman Sachs put out and measured it empirically and found that um, four out of the five times it hit this signal, there was no pullback in stocks. It was zero to two percent, which means it probably corrected in time versus price. And then in one instance in February of 2018, it corrected in price and you had that 10 to 15 percent pullback. But because it's stretched doesn't mean it can't get more stretched. Uh, it just showing showing the data there. Uh, other thing people are pointing to is the McClellan summation index is at an extreme. It closed at 1040 when we wrote this article earlier this week. Uh, Urban had posted when it was at 940, so it got even more stretched. But he highlights all the points in time when it got that extreme. And yeah, you might have had some short-term choppiness, but you it was basically a buy signal, not a sell signal. It just meant that you were in a strong secular uptrend and um you know you had you, you always have it coming out of these huge drawdowns these huge collapses like in early 2000 early 2009 and a huge collapse we just had in uh, uh march of 2020 so now you're getting these buy signals and that's what you get on the way up so uh it's more often a buy signal than a sell signal certainly in the intermediate term in the short term maybe some chop and that wouldn't be surprising then uh, people are saying, well, breadth's elevated now, you know, X number of stocks above their 50-day moving average, X number or whatever, 90% above the 50-day, 90% above the 200-day, etc. cetera. Uh, he takes this tact, uh, two important measurements on breadth, less than half of S&P 500 stocks are down greater than 10% from the highs which is near an expansion zone where prior bull market expansion rallies began. Just 23% of S&P stocks are down greater than 20% from the highs, best breath of the recovery already in the expansion zone. So he lays out that what people are viewing as extreme with recency bias, yeah, it's extreme relative to zero, which they were at in March, um, you know, measures that were closer to zero. Now, now you're much higher. Uh, however, when you go from such a low level to that first thing, everything looks overbought and it gets more and more overbought because it's just coming off of such a depressed level that it persists on an intermediate basis, short term basis, next few days, few weeks, who knows. But uh, he shows the historical trends coming out of these huge drawdowns. It just persists higher coming out of the huge drawdowns, persists higher coming out of the huge drawdowns, persists higher. And it's the same thing with the more than 20 percent down exact same thing we had in March. So that was a good thing from at macro charts. The other thing, GDP is negative. Why are we going? The market can't keep going this high with negative GDP. We'll contract at almost 3% or greater than 3% in 2020. Uh, well, that's backward looking. Forward looking is uh, plus 5 to 6% uh, as a function of money supply, which we've covered. Deutsche Bank put out this chart saying, okay, well, money supply is increased, you know, 24, 25%, but GDP is still negative. Well, that's because GDP is a lagging indicator and M2 money supply growth is the leading indicator. So you've had growth of money supply on a six to nine month lag basis, then you get the increases in GDP. So uh, expect this uh, light blue line of nominal GDP to just flick up uh, here in the next six to 12 months. Now, keep in mind the reason you have this, what they call a jaw, open jaw, is because we're waiting for normalcy with the vaccine, which uh, people should start getting pricked. Uh, they're already starting in the UK this week, and uh, they will probably start by Monday in the US moving forward. 
and that's a good thing. The other thing you're seeing is, oh, this is a crap rally because uh, only the weakest, the weak, the companies with the weakest balance sheets are outperforming right now uh, since you know November, the last month or so. And uh, if you look back, the last time this happened was when? The beginning of a new cycle in early 2009. What outperformed? Financials, what out, off the lows, um, and, you know, uh, the type of stocks that we're looking at, the cyclical stocks, the economically sensitive stocks that do well off of high nominal GDP growth coming off a low base, exact same situation. One more thing that rhymes, you just add it to the bucket. And then the last argument is, of course, the debt to GDP ratio is out of control, 128%. It was 120% post-World War II. And as I said, because of all the stimulus, because of the baby boomers, it got cut in half by the early 50s. It was from 120 down to 60. We're going to see a similar thing in the next three to five years. I think maybe we go a little higher first, but the growth and the money supply and the fiscal policy kicking in, we'll probably see a debt to GDP of 80% in the next three years and uh, probably closer to 70, 60 over the next five to eight years. And, uh, and that'll be a function of growth. Uh, the other thing is companies are not back, buying back their stock. That's not a negative. That's a positive. Uh, there were a number of notes, an article in Barron's. Uh, share buybacks for the first three quarters of 2020 are down 41%. All that means is pent up buybacks moving forward. And uh, RBC talked about the announcements being down. They're starting to come back up. Companies in the uh, S&P 500 have seen their cash levels rise 36% year to date to roughly 2.5 trillion, up from 1.87 trillion in the fourth quarter of 2019, just before the pandemic. So they've got more cash now. They've been able to refinance a lot, et cetera, liquefy with open capital markets due to the heroes that saved us from a depression, which were Secretary Mnuchin and Chair Powell and the administration. They did it unbelievable job in March. We would have been in a depression if not for them. And um, so that amounts to a bit more than $5 billion in cash for the average S&P 500 company if it's divided equally. But companies buy back stock when they have excess cash, not merely a lot of cash. Excess cash in the S&P, Wells Fargo says, totals about a trillion dollars or about $2 billion per company divided e equally. S&P 500 operating cash flow has increased 4% in the first three quarters of 2020 over the same period in 2019. That's astounding when you think about it. I'll say it again. Operating cash flow has increased 4% in the first three quarters of 2020 over the same period of 2019. Unbelievable. Uh, buybacks are down as even as operating cash flow remained resilient. Moving forward, the cash flow outlook for companies is bright supporting the share buyback thesis. Uh, free cash flow per share is expected to rise 29% in 2021, according to FactSet data. This is all stock market positive. You think the buyback game is going to be on like nobody's business over the next couple of quarters. And if you're positioned, you're going to get ridden with the uh, tide, <laughs> as we say, looking at the at the beach right here in Captiva right now. So uh, that'll be a good thing. Um so investors dumping large cap stocks. One of my favorite strategists that I like to listen to is Jim Paulson of the Luthold Group. Uh, he made the, the following points. on It was on Business Cider and I think he did it live. So investors recently started moving cash out of crowded mega cap stocks into cyclicals. We know that. The shift makes for a rare reversal that's previously led to outside outsized gains. Uh, market cap weighted index of large cap stocks outperformed their equal weighted peers over the last four years, according to a historic concentration in a select few tech stocks. Only seven previous instances of equal weighted underperformance have taken place since 1927. Six of them led to reversals that drove double digit annualized returns over the next 24 months, Paulson said. Once the equal weighted index turned around and began to outperform meaningly, as it has as of this week, uh, in the last few weeks is when it's made the turn. It proved to be a wonderful entry point for stock investors, and he shows the annualized returns of the S&P and the small cap, by the way. The small cap go through the roof, but the S&P in the uh, annualized total returns, the future two-year annualized returns, you know, in 1932, is 55% a year, 1957, 22%, 64, 13% a year. 1974, 15% a year. 1990, 21% a year. Uh, 2000 was the exception. 
uh, that was negative uh, 8.9%, and then 2008 was 17% per year. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Small caps, you can just add five or five to eight percentage uh, or more on each instance. But we've just hit it as of nine uh, September 2020. So that's when the trigger hit, and we're just getting started in the um, what he called the rare reversal, and we're taking advantage of that in spades. Now, on to the shorter term uh, view of the market. This is the same situation as last week where you had uh, the short term AAII is a little overextended. Uh, bullish percentage at 50, 48%. It got to this level in 2018 and you got a correction right away, 10%. But it also happened after the 2016 election and you rallied for 13 months. I'm more prone to think we're we have a lot more similarities to the post 2016 election scenario than we do to the 2018 scenario. And that's why I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt in the intermediate term, day to day and week to week, we need to consolidate and we're, we're probably going to do that. But it, it's more likely to be dramatically under the surface where some sectors will be rolling over and other sectors like uh, which we've discussed will be uh, outperforming in that trend will persist uh hint banks defense stocks and energy <laughs> so uh and this kind of shows those instances and what happened to the s p 500 after that uh versus 2008 you did have the correction but in 2016 it just you know it, it actually looks like it corrected sideways for about a, a few weeks here in late 2016 early 2017 and then resumed that dramatic uptrend after a huge run off the early 2016 lows Fear and greed index was over 80. Uh, again, that's you know that's not where you want to be buying the general indices in mass. You want to be focused on those areas where there's opportunity. And as I shared with Liz, I like to buy things on sale, not at uh, full price plus. Uh, when we were talking about the IPOs, National Association of Active Investment Managers, they've chased into year end. That's natural, but. These high, these elevated levels don't always indicate a rollover. In some cases, they indicate the beginning of a trend. Uh, C, <laughs> again, post-election 2016 through 2018, you hit this uh, north of 100% equity exposure, and it just persisted for another year, the rally. So um, our, our, uh, our message was pretty similar. We did add to emphasize the antitrust wind swirling about around Washington. We talked about it in, an, in our notes a few months ago, that's starting to play out and you're seeing the weight on some of those uh, sectors. Uh, but to our point in the market watch that uh, Sean Langlois covered, uh, easy money has been made in the general indices, but there's tremendous opportunity if you're selective and that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, so in the so while the market in the short term may look quote too good to be true in the intermediate term, uh, I want to hold you so much. <laughs> I want to hold the stocks and uh, thanks to Frankie Valley for that as the new business cycle has just begun. So uh, moving on just to wrap it up here, earnings estimates came up again this week, 169.46. Those are still way too low. Why are they way too low? Because banks are going to release probably about $50 billion of reserves over the next four to six quarters. That's not priced into either the bank stocks or the S&P earnings. The other thing you have is the Boeing 737 MAX uh, is now ungrounded. The pent up demand is going to be there. That's going to have a huge impact uh, in adding some, some earnings power to the S&P that's not yet priced in. And then going back to the sectors that are going to outperform energy off a basically non-existent base, you know, your your earnings growth is infinite when you start at zero. So they'll be the biggest uh, growth starting from nothing. Uh, I think Drake wrote a song about that. Industrials up 77% earnings growth. Consumer discretionary up 58% earnings growth for 2021 estimates. Materials 29%. Financials, 20.5%, S&P about 21%. But then you look at tech and com, com so those are the sectors that are going to grow in line or better than the S&P. Then you look at tech and, and communication services, they're only going to grow at 13 and 14%, um, a, a steep discount to the general market, yet their multiples are much higher. That's not how I like to play the game. I like to get more earnings growth for lower multiple and that's the opportunity we have by being selective. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for listening in this week. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. Make it a great one.